If you would please, let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, we have heard your word spoken and read to us. Now, God, give us understanding. May we leave here today knowing that we have heard not from what I would say, but God, from what you would have us hear. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Who do you say I am? This is the question that Jesus asks of his disciples immediately preceding the story that we heard read earlier. Jesus and the disciples are walking towards Caesarea Philippi, and he asks them this question, who do you say I am? And Peter, being, well, the most Peterific of the disciples, answers the way that only Peter seems to get away with answering questions in Scripture. Peter, if you don't know, throughout the Gospels, answers every question immediately when asked, and either says the exact right answer or the exact wrong answer. Here we have Peter give the exact right answer, but he doesn't understand what he's saying, which makes it even better. Peter, to this question of who do you say I am, answers with you? You're the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God. Now, it's really interesting that Peter immediately answers this question this way for, well, two reasons. The, the first is that naming Jesus as the Messiah means that he is naming Jesus as the one the prophets spoke of. The one that God has promised would come, the, the rebirth of King David himself into the world to right every wrong that has ever been done to the Jewish people, to the Israelites, to the Hebrews. He is the one who will come and who will reinstate the kingdom of David and bring the Jewish people out from under the, the thumb of oppression where they have been for generations at this point and back where they belong, on top. That's the first reason this is interesting, because Peter is putting a lot of pressure on Jesus. The second reason this is interesting is because another title that comes with being named Messiah is being named the Son of God, which at this point in history is a name only one person in the Roman Empire is allowed to have. And that's the emperor himself. Caesar, according to Rome, is the son of God. And so Peter, naming Jesus as the Messiah, both names him as the, the new coming of King David and usurps Caesar's place as the one who holds that title. Peter says something that is potentially sacrilegious if Jesus ends up not being the Messiah, and definitely, definitely treasonous within the Roman Empire. But he says it, and he seems to really mean it in that moment, and, well, only in that moment, apparently, because in the very next verse, as Jesus is talking about what it means for him to be the Messiah, to be the Christ, to be the anointed one and the Son of God, Peter immediately turns and rebukes him for saying what he says. Jesus says that to be the Christ, the Son of Humanity will suffer at the hands of the authorities, be rejected by his own people, be killed. And Peter says, now hold on, Jesus. This is not what I meant when I said you were the Messiah. I had a very clear understanding of what I meant by that title when I said it, and you're not living up to it in this moment. Because what I meant is, you're supposed to be the hero. You're supposed to be the warrior. You're supposed to be the general. You're supposed to be the king. And kings don't suffer, Jesus. Kings don't allow themselves to be rejected by the people. Kings don't die, Jesus. Kings instead make sure that those who need to die, die. 
and those who need to be brought into a place of prominence are able to do so. Peter says, this is what I meant when I said you are the Christ, Jesus, and I need you to be that kind of Christ right now. But friends, Jesus didn't come to be that kind of Messiah. Jesus didn't come to locate himself in that kind of story. Instead, what we hear in the gospel accounts, in the witness of Scripture, is that Jesus constantly locates himself, situates himself among the suffering, with the oppressed, alongside those who are, are hurting and grieving, found amongst the shamed and the cast out. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, our King, situates himself on a cross. Because the truth is that Jesus did not come to be Caesar or King David. He did not come to be the Roman emperor version of the Son of God, nor did he come to be the warrior Israelite version of the Son of God. No, Jesus came to be something else, something more, something harder, but something better. And my friends, Jesus calls us to be and do the same. You see, this is the second part of that question that Jesus asks of, who do you say I am? Because he asks this to a very specific group of people, a people who have already entered into this kind of covenant and contract to follow Jesus and to emulate Jesus and to be like Jesus. And so Jesus asking, who do you say I am, is Jesus asking, who do you think you're following? What do you think it means to emulate what I do? Are you really willing to go where I go and be found amongst the type of people that I'm going to situate myself next to? Are you willing to take up your cross, knowing that that's what it means to follow me? Now, for Peter and many of the apostles, our tradition tells us that this literally meant martyrdom. As the story goes that Peter in Rome was told he was going to die the same death as his Savior and asked, because he didn't think he was worthy of it, to be crucified upside down instead so as to not be just like Jesus. For the apostles, taking up one's cross in a lot of ways meant literally doing this. I wonder what it means for us as the church today, the church in San Antonio, Texas in 2024, what does it mean for us to situate ourselves alongside Jesus? Where is Jesus locating himself today in our world? Is it in the bombed out remains of an orphanage in the Ukraine two years and one day after the conflict with Russia started, where orphans still gather together, terrified and alone? Is it in the tent cities of Rafah, where Palestinians quake with dread, wondering when the next airstrike is going to come? Or maybe it's closer than that. Maybe it's at the Rio Grande, where a mother has to decide if braving the water filled with razor wire is worth trying to get her children to a safer place. Or maybe it's even closer than that. Under the overpasses here in San Antonio and in the stoops of larger buildings where 
our siblings who are experiencing unhousedness reside? Or in the homes of our youth, where some are terrified to come out to their families for fear of being cast out. Where does Jesus locate himself today? Where are we called to locate ourselves today? For if, as Jesus demonstrates, being Christ means being found among those who are suffering, those who are oppressed, those who are grieving, those who are shamed and marginalized. Are we willing to follow Christ there? It's one thing to name Jesus as the Messiah. It's something much harder and much better to follow him. So friends, I ask, who do you say he is? May we answer, and may we go. Amen.